I'm sitting here in the back of the sanctuary and looking around. I see up at the front of the cross where we're reminded of God and his incredible love for us. I'm reminded of all that God has done, his grace, his mercy. And then I begin to look around this beautiful sanctuary. I see the organ, which reminds us of how we get to gather in this place to sing praises to our God, the one who is truly to be worshipped and praised. But then I see something else. Do you see it too? I see a bunch of empty pews. And it strikes me that we don't see very many sanctuaries that are designed for one person. I know that may sound silly, but sanctuaries aren't designed for one. But in many ways, they're designed for many. Their desire to bring people together from all different places, from all different walks of life, with all different joys, with all different struggles, so that we can worship God together, but also that we can do life together. I've been thinking a lot these last few days about, well, what's the difference between what we're able to do in online worship? And what are we able to do in our worship together? And in many ways, online worship has been such a joy and a privilege because it's been able to allow us to continue to worship in our homes and throughout our city and around the world with people that we may never, ever have the opportunity to be in a room with. And what a beautiful and a great and a creative thing that is, that God was able to use technology to bring us together even when we couldn't be physically in the same room together. But one of the things I've missed over this last year as we've worshiped together, as we've sung together, as we've been pointed to Jesus together, is filling some of these seats together. And I've been thinking about, well, why is it that I miss it? Well, part of it is I, I'm an extrovert. I get my energy from being around other people. Part of it is preaching's a lot more fun when there's a room full of people than a lens. Part of it is I like you guys and I want to be with you. I want to spend time together with you. But I think there's another element of it, and we hear it in these words of Hebrews chapter 10. As the author of Hebrews is painting a picture of our life together, here's what he says. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. He's saying that we get to come before God with confidence because of Jesus and who he is and all he's done for us. He talks about how worship is this idea of being brought into the very presence of God. And, but he doesn't stop there. Here's what he says. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promises faithful. He says there's going to be times in life when faith is going to be hard, when we're going to be tried and tested, when there's going to be things that make us go, huh? There's going to be times where we're going to struggle to understand. And he says, let us hold fast this confession. Let's not give up the faith. But let us continue. Let us cling to this confession, even when it's hard, even when it's difficult, and even when it doesn't make sense. Now check out these last two verses. Verses 24 and 25 of Hebrews chapter 10. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You know, as the author of Hebrews is painting a picture of worship, he goes, don't give up meeting together. Why? We were created to do life together. We need other people in our life. This is a Genesis 2 reality, right? God looked over his creation and he says, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. And for the first time he looks at it and goes, this isn't good. What was that thing? That Adam was alone. He needed someone to do life together with. You and I need people to do life together with. And part of that is, he says, we need people to stir us up. Because let's be honest, left to our own devices, many of us would just stay in the same place doing the same thing the way we've always done it all the time. This is physics, right? An object left to its own devices will stay put until acted upon by an outside force. Oftentimes in our life, people are that outside force that come into our life and force us to do things that we should be doing that maybe we're not. But then there's that other piece of it. 
It says encouraging one another. We need those folks who breathe life, breathe encouragement, breathe love and peace into the lives of one another. And friends, as I look around this room, as I see these spots, I can see the people who sit there. And what a joy and a privilege it is to have them as a part of my life. And I can't help but think that the life of a disciple was never meant to be lived alone, but it's meant to be lived together. Sometimes that life together is in this place as we fill these pews, and as we worship God together, as we're pointed to Jesus together, as we receive God's gifts together in absolution, in communion, in his word. But we're also doing life together as we chat afterwards as we go through and do life, that we could stir up one another, get each other out of our comfort zones, but also as we encourage, build up, breathe life into one another. What choice will come in your life by sitting in these pews? Not just from the words that you've heard or the music that you've been able to experience, but by the people who have sat next to you in these pews. What part of your walk with Jesus have these other people or other people in your life played in pointing you, encouraging you to look to Jesus?